Tommy Hilfiger and his namesake brand disrupted the fashion scene in the early 90s. His designs were preppy yet bold. They invoked images of classic American luxury that would soon catch the attention of cultural tastemakers. When the top rappers of the day wore the brand on national TV, a love affair between Hilfiger and hip hop began. With Kadada Jones as a muse and Aaliyah as an ambassador, beloved spinoff brand Tommy Jeans gave birth to the tomboy chic style still in vogue today. Today, we reunite the figures at the center of Tommy's heyday and celebrate Tommy's current impact on streetwear. This is Complex Conversations, Hill Figure and Hip Hop. I'm Andy Hilfiger, really excited to be here. We've got some iconic stuff happening today at Complex, and I'd like to uh, bring up Tommy Hilfiger. <laughs> Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> and, and Grand Pooba. <laughs> All right, guys, I'll have a seat here. So Tommy started his business, Tommy Hilfiger, over 30 years ago and retained Classics America. And uh, today, Tommy Hilfiger is among one of the most recognizable brands in the world. Lewis, congratulations. You're a five-time world champion, Grand Prix, Formula One race, racing. And you have a collaboration, and you're a designer. They have their clothes on. Uh, Tommy and Lewis have a line, Hilfiger Hamilton, that's out worldwide now. Grand Puba, you're a legend in the hip hop world. Your music made a mark in the industry and continues to do so, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me, man. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Tommy, you are known for being, you are known for being one of the pioneers of the 90s sporty streetwear look that made a huge comeback today. The Tommy Jeans photo shoot we did with Aaliyah is among the most recognizable images in fashion. We met her in 1995 when she was a new artist and cast her in our fashion shows and ad campaign. What did this campaign mean for you and the brand? Well, for me it was like unlocking the door to music, fashion, and celebrity advertising and embracing the culture as a designer and allowing, I think, the public to realize that we were going to break the rules in fashion. So we started making clothes way oversized. We started making logos way oversized. We started listening to the, the, the youth. Cool. Pooba. You, yeah. You embraced Tommy's signature 90s preppy look with the uh, colorful, oversized pieces. How did you find the brand, and uh, what drew you to this brand? Actually, it's a funny story, um, a true story. Um, we just say a guy used to get clothing, and um, I purchased something, and I, and I liked it. Like, it, it was a sweatshirt, it was a yellow sweatshirt. It had, uh, blue trimming around it and around the neck. Right. And it had the crescent. And it was different. It, you know, it wasn't polo. It wasn't something that you normally see. And it's the first time seeing it. But the way you matched it with the sneakers and the whole thing. Oh, that, you that's guys that's regular. You have to do that. But the thing, the thing was, <laughs> the, it, it, before rugby, it was the button up, the stripes. I right. think on one of the album covers, I, I wore, wore the button up. And um, shortly after that, then I you know, started finding more and more. And, and it, I just stated it on the record because it was something that was new. Right. And, you in know, in hip-hop, you always try to be innovative and try to do something that the next man ain't doing. So, Jabot's hanging baggy heel figure on the top. Yes. You know, knapsack on the back. It's just my flavor. I, and then you, you know, did the song with Mary J. What's the 411? Right. Tommy Hill figure top, yeah. See, that, it was like... Like, nobody heard of that at that, at that time when I did it. Right. You know, I made them aware, and then they seen the visuals and the videos, and, you know, it went from there. Like, you know? Well, I lived in uh, Spanish Harlem at that time, uh, 109th and Broadway, and 
the kids were coming up saying, Andy, Andy, they're saying your brother's name in the, in the song. Right. So I played Tommy the uh, tape. Right. The right. Tape. I brought it over to his apartment. And Tommy looked at me and said, oh my God, this is so cool. Music and fashion. I mean, anyway, that was an iconic moment for us, hearing mm. the Hilfiger name right. in, a st uh, in a song on that tape. Um, Lewis, you have cool style on and off the track. Everybody always checks out what you're wearing, especially this new line. Pooba has it on. I think Tommy. This might. is crazy that you're wearing it, man. Hill figure yeah, Hamilton. Just the video. It's hot. Growing up in the '90s, Lewis, who were your uh, fashion icons and street style fashion idols? Well, I grew up uh, just north of London, and um, naturally, I was crazy into racing, but I was heavily influenced by hip hop. So, uh, Tupac was my someone I particularly followed back then, naturally with Biggie, but Jay, and um, Diddy. And so I was, I was always wearing oversized clothes back then. And yeah. I remember Aaliyah coming on the screen and just seeing how beautiful she was at the time, I had a crush on her. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and that's the first time I noticed the, the, uh, the Tommy Hilfiger uh, logo. And um, then obviously not seeing the brand, I never in a million years thought that I would ever get to meet Tommy. You know, we happened to bump into each other in New York, I think it was five or six years ago. Oh, wow. I was coming out the, the plaza where, um, I hadn't been to New York too many times, but I was coming out the plaza where they did Home Alone 2. Yeah. And I hear someone calling me from behind and turn around and it's, it's, it's Tommy. And um, then we kept bumping into each other at a couple of different events. And he's like, we got to do something together. And I was like, there's no way Tommy really wants to do something with me. It's great the H is split. It's Hilfiger Hamilton that's so yeah, iconic. Yeah, it's LH. So mm -hmm. it was key when we were yeah. doing the designing. Um, went to Amsterdam and we sat down discussing the design. Yeah. And if you look at the logo, it's just, you know, Tommy's logo, it's epic, you know, it's iconic. Right. And naturally, the goal for me was to do some, to, to utilize the logo, but do it, make it look a little bit different so that it could stand on its own. Um, so. I'm very it's proud brilliant. to be a part of the brand. Now, Puba, musicians today look up to you and your iconic songs you've created. Who were some of the artists that inspired you? Wow. Um, I'm like a 70s child. Like, so I, I grew up like a soul music, like whatever. Like when I was a kid, there was no hip hop. Like, right. So it was whatever your mother and your father was listening to. Yeah. That's what you had to listen to. So I was kind of um, influenced by soul artists, like all the great ones. Like, you know, we could say Stevie Wonder, we could say Donny Hathaway, we could say, yeah. um, you know, all, all the soul. It's, it's, it's such a big basket. But once hip hop came into play, I have to, it's the original forefathers of hip hop. Groups like Cold Crush Brothers, Breakout. Um, Grandmaster Flash, the early days, I was influenced by them, and that's where I kind of developed my skills from, you know. And what was the first album you did? First album I did was a group called Masters of Ceremony. Right. Um, it was called MCs. And then um, from there I went to... Uh, Brand New. Brand New Right. Then I started my solo project, and then I worked with everybody, you know, Mary J with her first album, and the list goes on. Like, yeah. You know? And Lewis, music's one of your big passions. How does the world of music inspire you? Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very lucky to have grown up in I've you know, the 80s and 90s, where I got to be a part of listening to a mixture. My parents were also listening to a lot of Don Hathaway and yeah. you know, Sam Cooke. So I got to be kind of in the middle of where I got to be some of the older music and the new, new. Um, but I mean, music takes a massive role in my everyday life. I don't go through a day without listening to music. And honestly, when I'm, you know, when you're training, traveling, um, before I get in the car, I'm I always, always listen see to you listening to music. I'm always listening, yeah, because it's a racing form one. It's you know we do crazy speeds. That, uh, the fastest we do is like 230 miles an hour, down to like five miles per hour <laughs> in seconds. Right? Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> But it's more so not the speed that we do, it's more the, the speed we go through corners. It's like a plane upside down. So a plane has lift, our car is like, has wings that push the car into the ground. So the faster you go, I think at 100 miles an hour, we can put it on the ceiling and it stays there. Wow. So, and what happens is when you turn these corners at these crazy speeds, you pull a multiple of your, of your body. So six times your body weight. So yeah. some races I lose 10 pounds. 
Wow. And in an hour and 45 minutes. So if you want to lose weight, yeah. drive a Formula One car. I started when, racing when I was eight in go-karts. My parents split when I was two. I spent the weekends with my dad. My dad had no idea what to do with me. <laughs> and, um, a and I was watching for one with him. And my, my dream was to be a Formula One driver or a Superman, one of the two. And um, my dad bought me a go-kart for my eighth birthday. Wow. It was owned by five different families, bought out of, out of the newspaper. And I was, I, I was living on my dad's couch at the time. And we went down to uh, the DIY store after hours and started yeah. driving around. Then we found a racetrack and we started racing. And um, it, was, it started out as just a good hobby for us, but then we started turning heads. And we're the only black family there, so I always relate to Cool Runnings, if everyone's seen Cool Runnings. <laughs> no? You know, when they, get to, when they get to the top of the hill and they're the first ones with the rusty old bobsled, yeah. that was us with this yeah. rusty old go-kart. What do you listen to before you go on the track? Honestly, I just listen to a wide range of things, stuff. Yeah. If I'm honest, I actually, I've been working on music for a long time. I started playing guitar when I was 13, so it was always something, a, a kind of side project that I do. Um, I've managed, I've worked with a lot of different people out here that work with Drake, and um, yeah. I'm still yet to work with Pharrell, but it just, I love just being creative. It's another way of tapping into something different. A lot of athletes, if you look at sportsmen and women, when they stop their sport at the top, there's not a lot of them have planned for what's afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of gone against the grain and trying to do different things. So doing this, for example, with Tommy, is, it's, so cool. it's huge. There's no other racing driver that's done it. And uh, I'm so grateful for Tommy for giving me the opportunity to, to learn. I'm, it's basically an internship I have with him because I'm trying to learn Good. from him um, with the ultimate goal of one day having my own brand. Oh, you definitely. And, um, this and is a good uh, way to start There's no better planning the seed. With. I want some Hamilton. <laughs> Talking about music, a defining moment for the brand was when Snoop Dogg, who we just saw, wore the red, white, and blue rugby on Saturday Night Live. And um, Tommy Hilfiger really became the coolest brand in America at that point. And uh, the shirt sold out in a day. But looking back, did you know that uh, this was going to lead to such a milestone for the brand? Well, we felt the energy because uh, we couldn't really manufacture enough fast enough because everything we put into the store sold out immediately. And what we found was that you know, big logos were brand new to people. People had never seen uh, sporty looking apparel with really giant logos. Mm -hmm. And that was like advertising for us because kids on the streets would wear the logos and it was, it was like advertising. But it uh, made the brand very, very cool and also made us think that, yeah, we don't have to follow the rules of the fashion industry. It's better to break the rules in the fashion industry. And we started opening shops and department stores and opening our own stores. And we did fast fashion before fast fashion was fast fashion. So what we did was if we came up with an idea, we would manufacture it immediately and put it into the stores immediately without waiting for orders and without waiting for all the red tape. And we found that the faster we got new ideas out in front of the customers, the faster they would buy. And, uh, but Tommy, success it never comes easy. There's a lot of ups and downs, and you've had to face a lot of difficult times, difficult times in your journey. And one was the vicious rumor that we all know is not true, but the rumor that you're a racist or came on the internet in 1997. Um, and it really hurt you and hurt us. We, even Oprah said it's a big fat lie. Um, hip hop's played a big part of the brand's history, and it's a relationship you value dearly. I personally know what a tough time it was for you to go through, and how did you overcome it? Well, I think uh, my fans and people who know me know that that was a rumor, and that was untrue. And uh, I really believe that Quincy Jones was very helpful to me because Quincy said, you have to meet my friend Oprah. And Oprah said, Tommy, come on the show. We're going we're gonna to dispel this nasty lie. Right. And that was very helpful to me. But uh, more than anything else, it uh, hurt my heart because I didn't want yeah. people to really believe that. And, you know, with 
the internet today, uh, rumors start and people obviously believe a lot of what they hear or what they read. And uh, I think that it's very difficult to dispel a rumor because once people start believing something like that, yeah. it's ingrained. But every chance I get, I try to uh, let people know who the, the real Tommy Hilfiger is and the real person. Yeah. Uh, I want people to know the real person I am. Uh, that rumor is untrue. It's a lie. <laughs> it's, it's a total lie. So, Lewis, what aspects draw you to a brand when it comes to your personal style? I'm really um, amazed at what Virgil's doing. Yeah, the off-white you know, thing or? With off-white, but also with LV. I think he's just, uh, he's, you know, for me, I'm looking up to him. Um, yeah. Really seeing what he's doing, I think so many people can. I think he, the mixture of culture you see, I think today I believe um, Off-White has been announced, I heard, uh, more popular than, for example, Balenciaga. But I'd like to just say that with the collabs, I think a lot of companies do a collab with someone and they really use the someone or the other brand just for marketing. But it has to be authentic and it has to be real. So when we started the collab with Lewis, I said, we don't want to design it. We want you to design it. We want your ideas. So he came into our design studio with all of his ideas. He came with pictures, photographs, tear sheets for magazines. He came with samples of clothes, stuff from his own closet. So we actually gave the pen and pad to him and said, you do it. You design it. You show us exactly what you want to do. So I really believe that when you have an authentic collab, people really see through it and they know it. They know it's authentic. So it's not Tommy designing it. It's Tommy providing the tools necessary to execute Lewis's ideas in this case. And Lewis, you have over 7 million followers on Instagram. Wow. I actually just hit eight today. Eight million, another million, um, that's all. Um, Congratulations. You know, when I dreamed of being a Formula One driver, I didn't think that I would have a fan. Right. You know, and when I got to Formula One in 2007, I started driving down to the, the, the gas station and people started coming up to me and I'm like, I was so, I felt so awkward. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, um, and obviously back then, I think it was probably MySpace or something back then that I was having, I didn't okay. have any followers. <laughs> And it was very, very strange just to transition into it. But I think it's, it's great. And I think, obviously, people have a different way of using it. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I really see it as a, I've got quite a responsibility. I've got a lot of kids, for example, who are either aspiring to be racing drivers or aspiring to do something great in life. And I feel like I've got a platform to, yeah. to help either encourage, um, ignite a flame that's, that's just waiting there to be yeah. ignited or, um, or you know, sometimes you just post something and, pe and you, people comment and say you just made my day because they've had a bad day. So it's just crazy how powerful it can be. So but also powerful. when I'm traveling, I am keeping up, trying to keep up with the times. You can't, I can't be in two places at once. So right. often I miss the, the fashion shows. So I'll be um, seeing, the, what's, seeing what's going on, yeah. trying to keep up to date with the, how, how the movement is going at the moment. So I think it's like you, you're having your own TV network to basically show whatever you want to show yeah. to the public. So we look at it as being the communication tool of today. And where it's going after this, I don't know, but I want to be there wherever it's going. I want to be a step ahead with technology, with social media, and with whatever can be new and disruptive today. And Tommy, what? What has uh, been the biggest ways that fashion has changed in the age of digital and social media? Well, I think that uh, we never had Amazon. We right. never had e-commerce. We, we wanted something, we'd go to a store to buy it, and maybe a, maybe a catalog. But now uh, e-commerce is over half the business. And in China, it's like everything, like Alibaba or JD.com, and people are shopping on their phones 24-7, so most of the business is being done uh, by mobile app or by uh, electronic shopping. It's not 
necessarily, even though there are stores in China, it's not like the majority of uh, product is sold through stores. So that's really the change. And Tommy and Lewis, what can we expect from the Tommy Lewis Hamilton collection next? Is, is there new stuff in the works? Ask Lewis. <laughs> It's, it's, really, um, it's really difficult. It's such a hard business. And I, you know, when I entered into it, I, as I said, I tried to come with the, uh, the uh, approach of, I'm, I'm here to learn. So yeah. I don't have uh, all the answers to every single question, but I like answer, asking questions. So I ask a lot of questions. I've got this great team. team Tommy's got an incredible team yeah. in Amsterdam and in New York. So I get to go and work with these great people. But we've already done the second, uh, you know, it moves fast. So as soon as we did the first, the first has just come out um, just uh, a month ago. The second one's already done. That's going to come out in, in March. We're discussing right now of where we're going to do the show. Because naturally, we could do it on a fashion week. Mm -hmm. But we want to be disruptive and do something quite unique. And a Definitely. lot of the clothes that I'm, put, I'm trying to get the clothes to be, um, I'm pushing Tommy and, and his team to find new um, vendors so that I want all the clothes to be recyclable. I want them all to be eco-friendly. So the first collection is... Recyclable. Yeah. Sustainable. Sustainable. So we're so. finding sustainable, sustainable fabrics. We're finding sustainable factories. I think it's such we're an important... really transforming the business into becoming much more sustainable. It's such an important thing, Absolutely. I think, that we need to... You know, look at the world. I think you look, look at the, how the oceans are today, polluted. So I just want to be a part of doing something positive. So the first collection's, I think, around 25% of its... Um, eco-friendly. Then the second collections now, I think is closer to 40. My goal is by the time we finish our last collection, which we actually just signed off the third collection for next September, which is crazy, because how do we know what people are gonna want and wear in September? I hope you like it. But um, that I'm hoping by that, that time, we've got to uh, close to 100% on that. And as I said, the goal is to be able to take, I love Tommy's name on this, on my shirt, for example, but at some stage you gotta take it off and let it live on its own. Well, let's hear it for these guys. Tommy Hilfiger, Lewis Hamilton, Graham Puba. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>